tonight, guys, it is um, about how to get the banks to say yes. Ross and Scott are going to be up here sharing all their secrets and all the knowledge they have at the moment in this market, in this lending environment, about what things we need to do to get the banks to say yes. Uh, Manjurul is going to share a lot about strategies, things to keep the portfolio going, how to grow the portfolio. We're also going to talk about some other things relating to, I suppose, not so much the banks as well, but what are other ways that we can obtain money? What are other ways that we can still invest in property, we can still build a portfolio without having to just go to the normal or conventional ways of getting the money, such as the banks. Tonight, um, just a bit of a disclaimer, the presentation is for general information purposes only. We, we are uh, accountants and brokers, but we do uh, stress that you should sit down with your financial advisor, your financial planner to get information which is relevant for your personal situation, as all situations are different and can change at any one point in time. I'll let uh, Ross share a little bit about Aussie Parramatta and Rouse Hill. Oh, or or well Scott. Or Scott, Scott, sorry, my apologies. Um, yeah, Aussie Home Loans in Parramatta and Rouse Hill. Uh, Ross and I are the directors uh, of those businesses with a couple of partners in Parramatta. Uh, we've been in Parramatta for 15 years and we've been in Rouse Hill for a couple of years now and that's uh, growing nicely. We've got 10 staff, 200 years of combined experience. Uh, Aussie's number one franchise for six years now. Uh, Australian Broking Awards is an industry award that we've won a couple of times that we're proud of. Uh, and more importantly, we're just property investors ourselves. We're passionate about property. We love investing in property ourselves. And that's why we do these evenings to share. Our customer value proposition is we work together with you to understand your needs and use our expertise to make it easy to reach your goals. Thanks. Now on to uh, Kesha, Parramatta and Liverpool. We've been operating for over 10 years in practice. There's over 34 years combined experience uh, between myself and Manzuru, probably closer to about 70 years when we include all the partners in the practices. We do have uh, around about 21 colleagues between both practices. Manzuru and I love property investment. Uh, between us, we do hold uh, a number of properties in our portfolio. We talk about it, we live it, we breathe it, we love it. If we could marry it, we probably could, we would, but it, properties are our passion, we love it. Our customer value proposition is really contributing to your life. Uh, with all the clients that we have, we try to find a way just to add that little bit of a special value, uh, not just to their tax, but also to their overall life as well. We'll get straight into what tonight's agenda is. Um, I'll, I'm here just to introduce. I'm really, really keen to listen to what Ross and Scott have to say tonight about current uh, lending market and, and the environment that we're in. We're really here to unveil the media hype, right? There's a lot of things we're hearing, whether it's 40% declines, 20% declines over the next four years, property markets crashing, can't get money, banks won't borrow, they're closing uh, your, your loans tomorrow, they're opening your loans the next day. CBA are pulling out of self-managed super fund lending. There's lots of different things we're hearing, but we're really here to unveil all that hype. Ross, uh, Scott's gonna give a bit of the market update, just what's really happening in the market. What are the real numbers that have been logged? Um, now, Ross is gonna be discussing how the banks are assessing your servicing, your income, and also what your borrowing capacity. He's also gonna talk about the other banks, I suppose, uh, I suppose outside the big five. Um, Manjuru will talk about those strategies as mentioned to keep the uh, to keep the portfolio growing and keep it ticking along, and then uh, I want to see some. Well, we're going to see some alternative ways that we can borrow through commercial funding, bank of mum and dad, which I'm very interested in. Manjuru is going to come back and discuss about joint ventures, private funding, and I'm going to share with you a little bit about options, things that I'm very passionate about, and things that I'm currently doing, and then we'll wrap it all up. So what I might do. Is what I might do is get, uh, get uh, Scott for the market update. Thanks, Jeremy. I'll just grab that. Can everyone hear me okay? I might just ditch that. Yeah, so I guess what we wanted to do tonight was have a look at the market update. There's so much noise um, in the media at the moment with doom and gloom and the skies falling in in regards to the property market. So when all of this information's coming, it's a bit of an overload and you're reading different articles from different people and it's... It's a little bit overwhelming as to what do you take in, what do you disregard, what do you take as gospel. So when I'm looking at all of this stuff hitting the media, I think, well, I want to have a look at the real numbers, have a look at the actual data that's come through and make some um, informed decisions on where we think the market's at and what do we think's happening. So 
I generally go to CoreLogic. Um, they've got some good reports that come out. Um, and I've just picked the eyes out of their last quarter um, slides and data just so we can have a chat about that and sort of get a bit of a picture from their point of view where the market is and what the actual numbers are telling us as opposed to the sky falling in. Um, if you're reading the newspapers uh, in the last couple of days, it's been, uh, it's been frantic in the last <coughs> few days. So um, we'll kick it off. So Sydney's recorded the largest uh, annual fall in dwelling values, uh, down 6.1 over the last 12 months. Um, and um, Ross Greenwood, I don't know if anybody saw the news last night, Ross Greenwood was talking about actual practical examples of people losing money. Um, Glenmore Park, there was a couple that bought last April for uh, 670000 had to resell now um, for six thirty-five. Um, a divorce sale, obviously a bit of a bit of a speedy sale. Um, they lost thirty five thousand, but that's five percent. Um, so the numbers are about right. A Bow Main property he commented on originally sold for uh, two point two. I think that was eighteen months ago or twelve months ago. That resold for just over just over two million. So the loss there was one hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, percentage wise, it was just over six percent as a loss. Um, and then I was curious to see the other ones that he found was a $7,500 loss and a $5,000 loss and a $2,000 loss. So I don't know whether he couldn't find three, but he, but he found two reasonable ones, but they were around about that 6% sort of mark. So the numbers for Sydney seem about right. Um, Melbourne's an interesting one, and we'll get to that, but the last 12 months have just been 3.4% drop for Melbourne, so less than Sydney in the last 12 months. Um, obviously Hobart still performing well in the last 12 months and um, sleepy Adelaide and Brisbane, nothing much happening there. Um, I have shown this slide a few times in the last um, seminars, but what I wanted to point out this time is the major drops that we're seeing across the country is in the most expensive properties. So this is the last 12 months. The black is the last 12 months decline. Um, so the major drops in the last 12 months have been at the higher, higher price brackets. What interested me this quarter is that the drops have started, the blue is this last quarter, the drops have started across the board. So while we're still getting larger declines at the larger end, we are now seeing the drops over the last quarter across the whole price bracket, which is, that brings in your Glenmore Parks that Ross Greenwood's talking about and things like that. So the last quarter interested me to see the turnaround from actual growth in the middle of, like the actual growth for the year um, at that middle level price point has been quite strong, but in the last quarter we have actually seen it dip, dip down. So whatever growth you're getting, you're starting to see it now decline and yeah. come back to probably even 0%? Yeah, so it's... So that's interesting, the last quarter effect. Sydney, um, we've spoken about the 6.1 drop over the 12 months. Last three months is just 1.5% drop in the last three months. So that's probably slowed up a little bit. Um, interestingly, 7.6 for houses has been the drop. There's been a larger drop in houses than there has been in um, units. Uh, so... I mean, I wonder whether that goes back to the last slide where more expensive properties are houses as opposed to the units. So the units are sitting more comfortably in the middle here at the moment. Um, so we've seen a larger drop in that higher price point, meaning that the, the homes have probably dropped off um, a little bit more. But I wouldn't suggest that that is... Yep. Going back to your last slide, what are the price points at each percentile, like the 10th and 9th? Yeah, it's a good question. This one is over two million, and this one is around about 1.5, 1 to 1.8. Um, is that they couldn't give me the exact figures because it changes um, state to state and capital to capital. But yeah, general thought is over over two million is that higher higher price point. It actually gets tighter. The, the the percentiles get tighter as you go down because it's sale percentiles. So there's no zero. So the zero might be 200,000 sort of thing. So Melbourne, the reason that I just wanted to show Melbourne is 
the, the values are lower in the last 12 months at 3.4, but the drops in Melbourne look like they've actually increased over the last quarter. The last quarter's actually fallen by 2.4% in Melbourne. So if we look at the Sydney, it was 1.5 in the last quarter. Um, Melbourne's uh, surpassed or the fall in Melbourne has seemed to be larger in the last quarter, um, which is interesting. But overall, in the last um, 12 months, it's been less than Sydney, but the last quarter, it's accelerated its decline. Brisbane, I guess I keep showing Brisbane because I just want it, to, I want it to go. I want to show some good news, but it's done nothing. So, nothing, point one. Well, it's going the right direction, Jeremy, at least. I suppose where everything else is falling and Brisbane is holding its own, that's positive. Yeah, it's a positive. But um, it, will, it will gather momentum. It, it surely will gather momentum as, as things really start to come back in Sydney and Melbourne. You know, people are, will be chasing those better yields in the Brisbane market. And in the last 12 months, it, it is just under 1% in terms of the, the growth um, in Brisbane. So on the positive side, it is going, it is going forward, but it is creeping slowly. Go. Um, articles yesterday prompted me to pop this one in and, and it's basically the number of sales um, across the country have declined by 10%. So the number of actual transactions that are happening, settlements, has fallen by 10%. But if you look at Sydney, the actual number of sales is almost 20% down um, on where it was year on year. So 20% less properties being sold um, in Sydney is, is that whole effect of people either not wanting to come to terms with where the market is in Sydney, uh, people trying to get a bargain and sellers not, uh, not wanting to um, let go. They were still looking for last year's prices. It has meant in Sydney, interestingly, that there's less properties coming on the market. So there is 6% fewer properties actually hitting the market in Sydney at the moment. So it's 6% down, but the actual number of properties on the market is over 20% higher. So what's happening is you, you've got fewer properties coming on each month, but they're not selling. So what you're getting is them starting to stack up on top of each other. So there's 20% more properties for sale now um, than there was this time last year. So what's the second table? This is state, this is capitals. Oh, okay. Yeah, so... Um, and. To, to look at Brisbane as the comparison, Brisbane's pretty well the same year on year. So th there's not really been a great effect in Brisbane either way. It's just neutral, um, whereas Melbourne is similar to Sydney, similar story to Sydney. Fewer properties coming on the market, but more properties sitting on the market. Benefit, or, or a plus side, is we're seeing rents starting to trickle up. So we haven't seen a decline in rents in the last um, 12 months, except for Sydney. Sydney's come back a little bit. 1.3% um, rents have come back, but in general, we've seen some growth in rents. Um, there was a bit of a fear that we were starting to see um, rents come back. Um, not so much. The data saying that there's actually been, while not staggeringly good, except for Hobart, which just outperforms the market, but we're getting small growth in other rentals across the other capitals, which is great. Yields are starting to improve um, across the country, but I guess that's as your rents are trickling up and prices are coming back. That's, that's uh, improving yields, if that's something to go on. Um, but it really means that property prices are falling that's improving the, uh, the yield side of things. Clearance rates. This is a little bit tricky to follow, but, but ultimately we're seeing clearance rates fall. I think last weekend Sydney was under... Um, 50%. So Sydney was at 48% in the last um, weekend. The same weekend last year was over 70%. So we've certainly seen a turnaround in Sydney. It's not just the percentage, is it? The number of auctions was at only seven or 600 on the weekend compared to almost 1,300 La last this time year. last year. So and of the 1,300, 70% went. Yeah. And only 48% of the, um, of the seven or 800 So it's went. dropped significantly. Yeah. And it, but interestingly, um, week on week, uh, Brisbane actually had an increase in its um, clearance rates um, last week, if that means anything. So there's a bit of talk about clearance rates. There was a, the, the article that prompted me to put this in was the worst two words in real estate is passed in. So that was the article. That was the sky falling, passed in. So anyway, that's what's happening with clearance rates. 
But tradi- I guess it's more your traditional lower market, isn't it? Where you get a bit of a boom market and you clear more, and then it's just come back to a reasonable sort of average, isn't it? Underpinning property, I guess you've got to look at that simple main driver, which is supply and demand. So when you look at housing demand, migration to Australia remains high, um, just coming off slightly now. But if you look at the quarters, the net um, overseas migration, we're still seeing 60,000 people migrate um, to Australia quarterly, and there's a natural growth of about um, 30 odd thousand as well. So you're talking 90,000 people, Australia's growing by every quarter, so just under 400,000 annually, and they've all got to live somewhere. So there's got to be that demand for property um, must continue. What happens with prices and all of those types of things, um, we can speculate on. We've got some great experts in the room, but supply and demand is the got to be one key driver to um, to property. So I wanted to just pop that one in, but that pretty well gives us a, a round market update covering a few of the articles that I've seen um, in the paper over the last couple of days, um, Jeremy. Well, we'll just uh, invite Ross and Manzurul up and uh, Ross is going to share with us a number of different things uh, about the lending environment and what's happening with the banks and Manzurul is going to give us a little bit of experience as well and comment on a couple of different things. So gentlemen. So what a time in uh, the finance market at the moment. It's, uh, you know, there's never been so many factors that have been affecting the finance market. And I was looking at, you know, presenting this talk tonight and I was just, you know, I'm confused. So I imagine, you know, what you guys are thinking because I was just writing down a number and, you know, so you've got APRA and ASIC changes, you've got tighter borrowing regulations, you've got interest only um uh, you know, the caps um, that the banks have. You've got, cap, you know, increased capital requirements by the lending. You've got, you know, things happening with the global markets and, you know, the US dollar and what's happening with oil and stuff like that, which is affecting, um, you know, bond rates and so forth, um, which flows through to us from an interest rate perspective. You've got, you know, out of cycle rate rises and changes. You've got, you know, looking at, a massive difference now between fixed rates and variable rates. You've got comprehensive credit reporting coming in. You've got living expenses being you know, really looked at really difficultly um, by the banks. You know things like investment property expenses that wasn't a big thing um, you know 12, 18 months ago is now something that they're really cracking down on. You know foreign lending rules have changed. Self-managed super fund. Uh, banks have been pulling out of that. There's talks of, you know, with the change in government and politics that, um, you know, negative gearing and, and so forth. We've, we've every day, and Scott tapped on a lot of um, the articles around the housing bubble and what's happening in, in that. You've got, you know, people's this interest-only cliff uh, people are talking about in the last three years. You've got... Um, you know, reports of banks calling in loans and line of credit. So, you know, out of all that, how, how do we make sense of it all? How do we make sense of it all? And, you know, how do we cut through the noise and, and come up with our own strategies? And I guess that's what we want to do tonight is sort of bring it back to, yes, there is a lot of noise, but it, what it comes down to is it comes down to you. It comes down to you and your individual circumstance. And what are the actions that you can do to, you know, to see how you can go through that? Is that a fair comment? Absolutely. And Ross, I suppose this that all we've been hearing for the last about 15, 20 minutes is a lot of doom and gloom. That's all mm. we've been hearing, right? We went through all of those slides and I was waiting for one slide with a sort of a slight increase mm. on the growth or something <laughs> positive. And we haven't seen it. So I suppose the question that I sort of ask is that how is it different is it different from the previous cycle or any other cycle? And is it that the world sort of collapse or is it just the time in the longer period of time as such? Yeah, so, I mean, if you look at what happens typically in, uh, in, in the market once the market slows, and, you know, to take the noise out of, you know, Scott had a lot of recent figures there, but the figures that he didn't show is, well, what has happened to property over the last 10 years? You look at somewhere like Sydney and Melbourne, you know, 70% plus increases. So 
if the market comes off you know, 10 or even 20%, you know, the, the growth in the last 10 years is still a reasonable number in terms of, and yeah, that gets missed because the headlines don't like to say how much money people have made out of property. It, it, it focuses on, you know, what's happening in the market today. And, you know, I know we were talking that we expected Sydney uh, and Melbourne to slow down, you know, probably 18 months, two years ago, and it probably went an extra year of 17% that we didn't think was going to actually happen. And we're like, wow, it's, it's actually still going. And a lot of us stopped investing in Sydney because we're like, you know, it's, it's not actually going to continue to increase in value. But guess what? It did. And so now, you know, there's a lot of hype around that, uh, the actual market I coming think, off. I think I suppose, Ross, to reiterate that point is that uh, the property market is for a longer period of time. And many mm. of those statistics, as you say, is over the last six months, 12 months, if we look back into the previous cycle as mm. such, we've seen the same thing back in 2003 as an example. The market was right at its peak mm. in, in, say, New South Wales at that point in time. Mm. I remember that in 2002, 2001, I thought the price was very well priced. And in 2002, 2003, I couldn't see any logic why the market was still progressing at that stage. And it did. And it did go down. And it did settle. And it did sort of increase over time again. Exactly. And, you know, you, you look at what happens and a lot of it is, is driven by that sort of fear and greed and the greed on the behalf of the seller that, oh, I still want to get the price that I could get six months ago. The, the buyer comes in and says, well, I'm not going to pay you, you know, that because I know I'm reading these reports, I'm reading the headlines, the market's not going there. So there's a, a standoff. And then the, the, the guy who's put his price, you know, the, the high price on his property goes, oh, I need to sell this, I'm going to take. And then so he takes a lesser price, price comes down. But there's a period of time where there's a standoff. And even so with that standoff, everything slows down, as you saw through, you know, from Scott's um, sales, because that person can't sell, which means he can't buy. He's not getting the valuation, so he can't get the equity to buy the next property. So a drop in property just slows the whole cycle down in terms of the actual, and you know, from a funding requirements, I think the difference that we're seeing in, in this particular market, to answer your question, is that there's other factors at play, as, as I've mentioned, in terms of that haven't been there, in terms of the, um, which is more the government regulations. Normally how a market, historically slows down is by raising interest rates and then the market slows down. In this case, it's been through government regulation. It's been through APRA and ASIC and slowing down the actual property market. So it's slightly different in that, but at the same point, you know, it, it's, it, it's something that will, you know, over the long term. Um, yeah. So I suppose uh, as an investor, uh, Ross, from my point of view, I'm quite curious to know that in terms of the bank assessing your loan and borrowing capacities, what are the changes from yeah. the bank's point of view in the last few months? Yeah. So hands up who is aware of sort of what's been happening with APRA and ASIC over the, you know, over the last sort of four or five years. Okay, so yeah, I'll, I'll go back and I'll, I'll sort of explain it from, from um, 2014, December 2014, the changes came in. APRA puts guidelines out to the bank to tell them, you know, and uh, it's the ADI, so it's the deposit taking institution. So basically anyone that you can open a bank account with, they, they uh, came under these guidelines. And the guidelines were, you're to assess loans in a certain way, or we'll get out our big stick. And the big stick is they need to hold more money in capital against their loan. So they don't want to do that, so they need to comply. So. Rather than, you know, we've probably had half a dozen lenders at that point in time assessing your loans at what your actual repayments were. So if you were a million dollars at 4.5%, the banks were assessing your existing repayments on your loans at 45000 Now, so the, the APRA turned around and said, no, we want you to do it at a benchmark, and that benchmark is 7.25% interest rate. We want to calculate it at principal and interest repayments. I know you're paying interest only, but we want to calculate it principal and interest repayments, and we want to take it over the remaining term, which is going to be 25 years, because you've got five years interest only, and you've got 25 years principal and interest. So we want to do it over the remaining term. 
So what that does to your borrowing capacity, instead of them looking at $45,000 in repayments a year, pretty much doubles it. So they're looking at around about $90,000 in repayments that you're paying. Um, so for anyone with a, a decent sized portfolio, if you've got say $4 million, you know, you're looking at an extra you know, $180,000 in net income to qualify for the same amount of money that you used to be able to borrow. So it, it caused a massive hit in terms of actual borrowing capacity. I suppose, Ross, the only additional sort of changes, right, in terms of your living expenses as well as the, your utility bills and the yeah, investment programs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, it's, the, what Mums are really saying is what's happened is, you know, with ASIC um, is really cracking down on, well, we don't want to just take a, a standard view on what someone's living expenses are. We want to really go down deeply and those of you that have applied for the loan in the last couple of months will, will realise you've had to provide you know, three months worth of bank statements for, for your transaction account so we can see the amount of money that you're actually spending. So we used to take a declaration from the clients, yeah I'm spending this, this and this, but now they're, they're, you know, some of the things and some of the questions we're getting asked, we were joking, amongst the brokers, you know, someone asked what, what a $30 um, chemist bill was the other day, you know, like 30 bucks for a chemist bill and they're going through a statement on, um, on that. So, um, Some of the things which I was adjusting literally today, mm. a client of mine is that uh, we presented the financial set of accounts and bank came up with a, with a proposition saying that there is a certain loan, which is a director's loan that we recorded that as a current loan, and the bank's proposition is that we need to change that into a non-current loan and the loan will be approved by changing it from current to a non-current. That's sort of phonetic, so to speak, and going into that level of sort of details with my 22 years of experience, mm. I haven't seen. Yeah, exactly. And what, what's, why is this coming? You know, so there was a banking royal commission into the misconduct uh, and... You know, some of the banks sort of have been taken over the coals and, you know, you have a responsibility to really crack down on, on living expenses for these particular clients and, um, and Westpac have been fined and a couple of others, ANZ, got into to hot water over it. Um, so hence the, the big crackdown. So everyone's running scared, the credit assessors are running scared. Um, and so the other area that we've looked at is in terms of property in investment expenses. So let's say, for example, you know, your rates and utilities on a property minimum is going to be two and a half thousand dollars a year. Probably, I would say, if you've got Queensland properties, it'd be, be more than that. But let's say, for example, they were and you had a 10 property portfolio. That suddenly added an extra $25,000 worth of living expenses that are onto your uh, expenses that the banks are now factoring in. So this you know, of a borrowing capacity, what, what does that mean? That means, you know, $300,000 comes off how much you can borrow, which is massive, you know, just for a short, a small change in terms of how they're, how they're looking at um, actually assessing your loan. So, you know, with these things, higher living expenses, so they're actually taking um, a, a more detailed look, investment property expenses and tighter servicing amongst the big banks, it means that you know, a lot more people aren't qualifying for loans that they used to be able to. So what flow on effects does this have? So um, hands up if you've got interest only loans on your investments. All right. So one, what happens once those interest only expire is you will need to reapply to extend those interest only. And so what you need to do at that point in time is the bank, and again, this has come from those APRA guidelines, the APRA has recommended that any change in a loan contract will need to be assessed under their new criteria. So even you, you got it approved you know, five years ago at the old criteria, when your loan comes off the interest only period, you need to get it reassessed based on the new criteria. And so um, a lot of people, you know, will fail that new criteria, so they need to look at well, what options do I have and what are my strategies that I've got in place to continue these loans. Yeah, so I suppose the question that Ross sort of comes in is that in my mind as an investor, so there is a lot of, I suppose, 
whether it's a Dumont gloom, there is a lot of negativity and so forth. But yeah. as it is today's topic, that how do we make the banks to say yes? What are the options? <laughs> so in terms of looking at uh, Ross, so today I was reading a report by the big water commission uh, suggesting things have turned a little right for uh, in terms of banks are now becoming a little bit more proactive going out there to try and get funding approval. So are you seeing that? His No, I haven't read the article. We are seeing rates come down. So he may be, say, I'm not sure if it's relating to to that, but we are seeing uh, you know, interest only rates coming down to try to attract new um, new borrowers in and even principal and interest. So I think you know, with the drops, I think it's more that, not so much the credit policies, but more about their appetite for those um, borrowers, but the, the yeah, sorry, banks were banks had the limit of ten percent investment loan growth book yeah. growth that was removed. So that's so that's where we've really seen the rates come down um, on the investment side of uh, side of things. So it's much closer to your owner occupied rates again. But in terms of the criteria, um, no, not seen any any loosening at all. No. Mm. So in terms of you know, as I say, and I, I want to touch on, I'll get to, to Mumsrul's point, but I want to just fully explain what's happening in terms of these different factors and go into a few of them a little bit more deeply and then we can sort of, you know, come up with some sort of tips in terms of how we can um, get around those. So the other one um, we've seen that's creating a lot of confusion for our clients is the out of state at all rate rises and the changes in terms of investment rates. So if you look at uh, uh, your portfolio at the moment, so interest only rates are higher than principal and interest. Um, variable rates are currently higher than a lot of fixed rate loans and, and interest only. And um, these are, this is for investors, I'm saying. So there's a lot of variances in terms of interest rates. And one of the ways that you can increase serviceability massively is by just doing a, a review of your existing lending. Because you know, in some cases, um, you know, I was, um, we do the loans for, you know, it's well known, we do the loans for um, the guys at Smart Property Investment. And you know, th their portfolio, you, know, you look at the interest savings over um, with you know, just doing some fixing and, and pricing, it was in the, in the order of about $30,000 a year in terms of savings in terms of across their portfolio. And that makes a massive difference when then you're looking at your borrowing uh, capacity just by sort of looking at what you can do there. And I think that's been brought on by the reduction in the current investment rates. So now we've got some, some argument to go back to the lender and say, well, if we move this client, we could now actually get them this rate. So we've got more leverage with the existing lenders rate-wise, where there's much better options elsewhere, where they're still sitting at a higher rate. So really trying to review as many portfolios as we can and look at fixed options, as Ross said, and try and put some heat, not wanting to refinance them, but just wanting to put re look heat on the existing lender to come to the party and drop the rates. And, and you can have dramatic effect to your portfolio without actually having to go through the, the process of refinancing. I suppose one comment which I'll say is that uh, if we go through the fixed rate and let's say the fixed rate is quite significantly lower and we can afford it and we can be eligible from the lending side of it, as, as an accountant and I suppose being the mitigating from my point of view is that I would still like to do the calculation on my own, mm -hmm. assuming that there would be some price increases over a period of time, mm -hmm. because whether the rate is in two years' time, whether it's three years' time, after that once it goes into variable rate, whether it increases, whether I can afford it. Right, so this is the time where we sort of say that a little bit back in doom and gloom that but it's the cautionary factor as such and the mitigation. Definitely, and you know, any decision again is a personal decision because what is your 
business plan for that property, yeah? I was just curious to know, from, from a practical, so not the experience you've had with Phil and others yeah. there and their rates, um, specifically across the board, if you would give everyone sort of practical numbers saying they've gone from four and a half to X, what are those numbers looking like when you're trying to reshop within the same institution and then take that money to others, sort of more on a, a broader day-to-day -day approach? I know it's hard to yeah, I mean... If you look at, the, so with a couple of the big fours, right? So in, in one case, some of their rates were sort of in the, in the fives and, or low fives, and it came down to 4.19 on a, a, a two and a three year fixed rate. That's, so that's one example. Um, so if you look at a you know, million dollars of lending, saving 0.8, that's eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000. Know, so it, the numbers add up in, in terms of, in that case. Um, some others were more trust borrowings, but you know they were getting a, paid a, in, in, in this particular example, they were paying I think about 5.35 because they weren't offering you know, much discount because it was in a trust. And then it, it came to about 4.34. So um, you know, there's quite significant um, savings to be had just by looking at their options and what was actually happening, and unless you're staying on your portfolio and regularly managing these things, and, and if you're still within that interest-only term, there's no assessment done, right? It's just a matter of it's a form and it's done. In some cases, it can be done over the phone. So if it's not effective, where it might not be wise is, let's say, for example, you've only got 18 months left on your interest-only. You can't fix it for two years because so you've got to sort of look at when your expiry dates are to when how long you're fixing it for um, would be would be my suggestion there. Uh, so the other thing that's happening in the market that I want to touch on is the comprehensive credit reporting. So that's starting to be rolled out now, and this is another thing that you you need to consider um, because. Every credit card limit, for example, that you've got over time will be reported, um, where at the moment it hasn't been. And your repayment history on those credit cards will be on your credit file showing your last 24 months worth of repayment. So it's really important that you, if you haven't got direct debits, um, that you set up regular payments, even if it's just for the minimum amount, you know, the $50 a month, just to make sure that you've made your repayment every month, even if you eventually go and clear it all down to zero. But, you know, they're, they're going to uh, start reporting on those things and it'll, it'll just put transparency. So any limits that you're not using, get rid of them, cancel the cards, um, you know, because you, the, the bank is going to be able to see everything that you've got over time. And this is going to roll out over the next couple of years. So we're already seeing, uh, you know, some of the majors already reporting different things. Um, but it will be mandated in the next couple of years that all lenders will, will report it. And this is nothing new. A lot of the, the global markets um, have uh, positive credit reporting. We're one of the only ones who haven't. So that's another thing uh, to be thinking. <coughs> Living expenses. It's really clear, you know, if you want to invest or, you, or if you've got um, if you're looking to start to invest, that you have a clear budget and you know what you're spending and you try to stick to that budget. Because, as I said, you know, a $2,000 you know, will relate to maybe $300,000 worth of borrowing, um, you know, a, a borrowing amount. So if you can reduce your expenses over, um, in order to, you know, over a three month period to show that to the bank that this is what my living expenses are, it's, it is going to increase your borrowing capacity in this, in this market as well. Uh, SMSF lending, I just want to sort of touch on that. There is still a couple of options in the market, but a lot of the majors uh, have recently pulled out. So St George and Westpac were probably one of the most aggressive in that space and they've pulled out in the last couple of months. CBA have pulled out recently. NAB pulled out a couple of years ago in residential. They're still in the space in commercial. Um, so really AMP um, pulled out in October as well. So 
you, you're really only left with a, you know, four or five uh, sort of lenders in that space at the moment. In fact, of Queensland, I think it includes two up to 600,000. So anything below 600,000 that you can't even apply for a loan, for a self -legitimate. Yeah, and I think you'll see that with the lenders that they uh, that stay in the market. You know, it's people like the likes of Macquarie who are still in the market. And I had a chat to the guys at Macquarie the other day because, uh, you know, not all mortgage brokers are accredited with every lender. And, you know, some of the mortgage bro brokers didn't have accreditation with Macquarie and they go, oh, I do SMSF, I want to I want to sign up. And Macquarie were turning them away and saying, look, we, don't, we want all your business. We don't just want your SMSF um, business, so we're not going to let you um, be accredited to write that business. So, in terms of so that space, in terms of is definitely um, is becoming harder, and you know that's because the market's contracting. Whether that opens up over time, you know, with the performance, but I, I think in the wake of you know what's happening with the the banking royal commission is looking at financial planning is looking at mortgages everything is in the so i think again a bit of this sort of um, panic in the market in regards to, to that. There was a couple of the newer sort of providers, yeah. so uh, literally yesterday I've seen a loan on self managed super fund on ING at 70% with a different level, and also Pink Tank, I think, quite a bit on the commercial side. Yeah, they, these so are commercial so options, yeah. So, um, and again, in any market, and any challenges, and that's how businesses are created, isn't it, right? Where someone can come in and provide a solution to what's challenging in the current market. And that's how we've seen a lot of this disruption. If something's not working, then you know, take Purple Bricks, for example. You know, they've come in and um, in the UK, they're, they're one of the top real estate agents um, in the country. And now they've come in and I'm, I don't know about you guys, but I'm driving around and I'm seeing a lot of um, you know, Purple Bricks signs, which is basically changing um, the way that real estate sort of commissions are paid to an upfront um, to an upfront fee, so there will be um, different funders and different options that you will see coming in over the market over the next um, years because yeah, we're already seeing it. Scott was talking about there was an article in our mortgage broking magazine that you know the first blockchain funder. Um, you know, was, was sort of coming out in that sort of mortgage space. So there will be different options in terms of opening up. But obviously, um, so we've given a few tips in terms of, again, how you can reduce your, uh, increase your borrowing capacity. One, so you want to reduce your um, credit card limits, personal loans, leases quite often have higher repayments even though you know in, in some cases from a tax benefit they might be but they they really harm your your ability to to borrow money look at in terms of your interest rates review rates drop your repayments uh, down as much as you can obviously um, look at the in your living expenses there's not much you can do about your property investment expenses uh, unfortunately. I suppose, Ross, one of the questions that I have is sort of, uh, or sort of the mum and dad investors' point of view is that they all start with few individual properties and with mm. themselves. And over a period of time, they become sort of more sophisticated. The structure sort of comes into account, the trust comes into account, we find a lot of joint ventures and so forth comes into account as well. So, from a banking perspective and from a funding perspective, how does that work? Do we still all have to stay within that sort of a national consumer protection, or because we are on a structure, we can be reviewed a little bit more sophisticated manner? Yeah, again, in terms of um, you know coming back to to that point, in terms of. It's more around is it what is the purpose? You know, is it residential or is it seen as a business um, a business purpose? And you know, depending on obviously in a in a trust, it can be seen as a business um, purpose. And and Mundra and I have had some experience with a, you know, a business banker that will assess those trust loans differently to. Um, you know, how an actual individual title would be assessed because they can take a more commercial 
slant on it. So in a case by case, I mean, still you still need, and I know we'll draw a test to that. You still need a lot more documentation where the property security base is residential. But yeah, there is an option there. Yeah, and I suppose mm. from my point of view, I went through the same exercise with NAB, I went through the same exercise with uh, Westpac as well. Mm. And uh, while they sort of all start with seven point two five percent P and I over the remaining term. They all take the living expense, they all take your sort of the utility bills and everything else, which is sort of how the numbers are. But what, what was interesting in my case, particularly with Westpac and NAV as well, is to see that on that sort of very conservative calculation, as they call it the ICR and the DCR, the interest cover ratio and the debt cover ratio, that I was way out of line in terms of my circumstances. Mm. Right, the debt cover ratio was some silly, like about minus 300,000 or so. But then what they did is that they sort of looked into the bigger picture saying, all right, provide us the projection, provide us the consolidated set of accounts, let us look through more sort of the normalization of the financial accounts. What is the true number as it is? And it's one of those cases in, in my circumstances that I had quite a bit of success. But it's depending on a case by case basis, as you said, and, and your complexity. Mm. So the next option you, you have is say, well, if I'm not qualifying, Hands up if you've got that point where you're not qualifying with the lenders, you don't need to put your hands up, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> in terms of, um, well, what are your considerations? What, what, what are your options to consider in terms of if you go next? And why would you consider it? Um, and so if we look to well, what's important in terms of, we've said, okay, we need to review rates, we need to, um, we need to know when all, all our expiry dates for our interest only uh, repayments are coming up. Why is that important? Because if you look at you know the the cost and you know per million dollars, it's going to be um, you know quite expensive in terms of um, additional monthly repayments on your loans once they roll out into a principal and interest basis. Uh, so you've got to you've got to consider. You've got to consider. I think it's about seventeen hundred dollars per million. So you, over, over a um, a number of properties, that that can that can add add up seventeen hundred dollars a month uh, in terms of your extra payments can add up quite a bit. So it's important to have a look at well, when's my interest only, and what is my plan for that. And rather than saying, well, what is my plan for it? Don't wait. Look at what your options are today. So you make sure that once that happens, you've got a plan. And so what, what are some of the plans that you're recommending to your clients, Monsrul, in regards to, to those things? Yeah, number of mitigation, I suppose, right? So the first mitigation which I sort of recommend is that uh, one, the first comment which I sort of say is not to panic. And that is very, very important for me, not to panic. And the reason I say not to panic is because, yes, this cycle could be a little bit different. We've got the Royal Commission, we've got a few other sort of challenges which we didn't have in the mm -hmm. past challenges. But we still had a number of challenges in the previous cycle. We had challenges on the cycle which is previous to it as well. So I remember of going to uh, a information evening of uh, Jan Summers many, many, many years ago, probably about good, about 20 years ago or so, and Jan Summer says that if you want to look through your newspaper article in the last 50 years and 70 years and so, you would see this headline comes over once in every 10 years, once in every 12 years, that our next generation would never be able to afford properties again, right? The prices are too high. On the OECD countries, we are on one of the sort of the more expensive sort of in our range. If we look through in terms of our median income and the multiplier of that median income with the average sort of the mortgage, that it's too high, it's sitting on the double digit and such. Lots of doom and gloom, right? So Jan Summers comment in there was that property investment is never meant to be easy, right? It's never meant to be easy. It's never meant to be easy of buying your first property and subsequent properties and so forth as well. But not to panic in the sense, the comment which I take to myself, banks are there in the longer period of time for lending. Yes, we understand that there are lots of challenges in the shorter period of time, but over a period of time whether that sort of changes. No. And the point on that is the reason banks are there from lending is what is the number one way that they make their profits? Yeah. Lending people money, Absolutely. right? So, you know, and the strength of the big four, and we saw it at the GFC, is a good banking system. So everyone wants the banks to be profitable, right? So, uh, and even the government in the long term. So we're seeing short term, so I think that's a great point. 
and saying all of those is that at the same time not to be negligent as well. So yes, we have to have mitigation. From my personal perspective, I'm sort of budgeting saying that, well, interest rates sooner or later has to go up. And it has to go up sooner or later, and we'll take that into account. Right, sooner or later, of my interest-only period will expire. It will be converted into p and I have to take that into account. So what that means is that now is the time that we just need to be a little bit more cautious, but at the same time, not everything sort of stops. I was speaking to uh, Paul the other day, and uh, Paul and I we were sort of joking within ourselves, and we were sort of saying that you know we will look forward in future, and I would dare suggest that we'll look back in 2018 and 2019, and we would say that you know what those were the years that there were opportunities to buy. Yeah, definitely. So in terms of um, you know we've got a slide up there in terms of saying getting out of the big five. Someone's added an extra one. Um, St George have snuck in there as a big five, I don't know, but um, <laughs> um, uh, Jeremy, where did the big five come from? Oh, St George, mate, I've got a soft spot for St George. <laughs> <laughs> I, I personally bank with St George, so I couldn't, I couldn't see him left out. Uh, okay, so we've got an extra one. We've got, we've got St George for Jeremy, he likes the friendly dragon. So again, we've said the reasons why you potentially want to look at getting out of um, some of the big banks, and, and it's not just the big five; it's it's the other ones. And you know, we've got a couple of um, second tier lenders on the screen there. You know, Liberty and Pepper, and the way they will assess your loans is different to the way the the APRA guidelines of a, a lot of the major banks. So um, even though they've sort of you know, tightening a little bit and uh, at the moment and it's, it is getting a little bit more difficult because they're still bound by ASIC and the living expenses and so forth. So, but there is options and you've got to weigh up your options in terms of looking at those interest only expiries and saying, am I, you know, from a repayment point of view, when I'm looking at what my repayments are going to go to in the future, am I better off to look at my options, even though it might be going on to a higher interest rate, um, but looking from a cash flow and looking at um, my long-term picture that my property is to hold my portfolio for the longer period of time, is that something that I want to con um, consider doing? Or can I extract um, some additional funding to do something else or to use as a buffer if I don't have a buffer in place? Um, to be able to do that. So that's some of the reasons why people are considering those. And outside of those, there are, you know, some other funders, um, you know, that the, they're not on our uh, Aussies lending panel, but I've heard of them. And, you know, um, some of the things that you need to consider about these second or third tiers or, you know, there's, there's private funding, there's, there's a number is quite often they'll charge you an upfront fee, um, similar to like a mortgage insurance type fee. You know, we, we had a mutual client the other day who was looking at the options to, you know, to, to buy a home and he failed with all the sort of the second and so he was looking at more a third and fourth tier and yeah, you know, the, the upfront cost was going to be something like $35,000. The establishment uh, yeah. cost, depending on where you go, could easily be anywhere between 1% to 2% plus yeah. uh, the GST as the charging. Yeah. Right? So it's about 2.2% is quite quite sort of common. Mm -hmm. So when you look through a loan of, say, a million dollar of 2.2%, that's quite quite substantial. Mm -hmm. Now, on that example is that in our case is that the gentleman desperately wants his principal place of residence. We understand our our dream as, as it is, right? But from his perspective is that he was going to go through a lender where the interest rate was almost about 8.95%, 9%, mm -hmm. the initial cost and all the rest of the cost. And this is where you sort of say that, you know what, what is the line to draw mm -hmm. and what's the practicality and are you better off to wait for it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just because they will lend you the money doesn't mean you should. You still need to do your numbers, run it by um, your accountant and so forth and look at not just the headline rate, but look at what the what the fees are associated with those. And, you know, because... Um, and we, we have seen, you know, the lenders and going back cycles, you know, around the GFC where um, if I was to go back to 2009, some of the rates with these second and third tier lenders increased more 
than your major lenders because they're not in the spotlight as much as the big four. If the big four were to go and raise rates by half a percent or a percent, it'd be frontline um, news uh, on, on the papers. But some of these second tiers, once you've, they've got you in the system, may slightly raise the rates up. Yeah. So I suppose, I suppose Ross, one of the other thing which I'm seeing quite a bit now is that, and it's interesting because I've seen that in the previous cycle as well, more towards the end of the previous cycle is the load of loans to sort of progressively start to sort of come back into the market. So we just had a recent example of uh, two, three number of sort of investors point of view that there is this, this what prospective load of loan where you self-declare, I suppose, your income saying that, well, I as a self-employed, this is what my income is. And as long as you can, to some extent, half justify it, the line sort of goes through and so forth. I suppose where one needs to be cautious is that the numbers still need to be correct. Even though you are not substantiating with all of your detailed financial accounts and the returns and so forth, the risk to me in my mind is that very often many of those information are data matched. And while they're sort of a data matched, it's a matter of time before sort of ATO sort of picks up saying, hang on, this is what you're declaring your income is. This is what your set of accounts and the tax return is showing. So there is a significant level of difference. So a bit of a desperation that I'm sort of seeing on the market, whether it is coming in as a panic. Yeah, I mean, under the all lenders, and regardless if it's um, you know for for residential or individual borrowers. The even if the lenders are doing low dock, and there's not really much such a thing as a low dock, where they call it medium dock, they want some form of proof, whether it's you know a letter from accountant, whether it's um, BAS statements, whether it's bank statements. Uh, there's a number of things that they'll want to see to justify your income because they're still bound by the laws, right? It's um, yeah, but. Obviously, um, you know, we are seeing you know, some of those options uh, come into the play. Um, but, you know, a lot of our investors, you know, and will look at a second tier lender like a Pepper or a Liberty because it is still a good option, right? So, and, you know, Paul was talking about some of the, the properties that, that he's purchased and, you know, I was chatting to a few of the other clients. and. Yeah, you know, the money that they've made long term from going into those different deals. So yeah, you've got to weigh up the opportunity cost. Of course, everything you know, has its risk, and you know, with property investment, there is risk, and it's about how do we minimise those risks. So, um, Mondrell's mentioned, you know, cash buffers, making sure that you you've got cash buffers in place, looking at your insurances, you know, reviewing your rents. Um, looking at in advance at your um, interest only dates and not coming to that point where saying I can't afford it. No, you know, 12 months, two years in advance and you might need to liquidate a property to, to provide you some, some buffers moving forward. So it's about planning and, and that's, that's really um, is definitely, you know, and, and my suggestion is don't wait, don't be ignorant, don't put your head in your sand saying I'll deal with it when it comes, you know, put a plan in place to, to be able to do that. Um, I guess, you know, in terms of what other options, so we've spoken briefly about um, commercial options and in terms of, I know we are talking more about um, commercial, but commercial is an option for people with you know, different risk appetites because the serviceability can be different. Well, I know we're going to discuss that um, a little bit further in detail moving forward. Um, and I guess you will probably see Munzerl, um, and, and I know, you know some of the clients and some of those other investors. Do you want to touch on what you've seen because it's not something that we do as mortgage brokers. How does private funding work? Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And very often the private funding, depending on private funding, is all about a business case. You need to provide a certain level of business case, you need to provide a certain level of exit strategy, and, and of course you need to sort of substantiate with your sort of the numbers, the set of accounts and the returns and so forth. So a couple of examples. So one common example with the private funding is from a builder's perspective where the builder sort of goes in the open world, they've got the land and they're sort of building it, they just need that sort of the funding right at the end to sort of complete their level of sort of projects and the time that it takes in terms of selling it and the cash flow to run in the meantime. 
So private funding very often is, uh, there's two levels. So you've got the mezzanine level of the private funding and you've got the more sort of the, more sort of the, uh, the, the sort of the lower sort of the risk of the private funding, right? The mezzanine funding is a shorter period of time and it can range anywhere between one to five years or so. And the interest rate from my experience at the moment are very high, anywhere between say eight to 10% is very, very, very common. Right. Sometimes more. You know. Sometimes yeah. more. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and the one off the establishment cost and so forth. But in some cases, it may still be worthwhile. So I've got a builder as an example who's sort of building all of those sort of the aged care sort of a construction. And as part of this aged care construction, the builder just needs a certain level of funding right at the beginning, but it needs a certain level of funding right at the end. And I sat down with a private lender, the mezzanine lender on that example. The lender said, show me the business case, show me the cash flow, show me where your exit plan is, and at the same time, show me the security. It's still the same fundamental, it's still there, your equity, as well as your serviceability, but it's more about the commercial lending. So is it for everyone? Definitely not. But is it for some of the circumstances? Potentially, yes. Muzzle and Ross did touch on it. Um, commercial lending is becoming much more an option for our um, investors that have reached that capacity point with their existing um, lenders, simply because it's um, the whole rules is that where ASIC and APRA are, are um, running with is called NCCP, which is the National Consumer Credit Protection. So it's consumer protection. Um, not business protection. So if you're buying within a company or a trust uh, and you're buying commercial property, it's not actually falling within these hardline rules. So it really is an option for people when they've hit their capacity point residentially that they're starting to look at um, commercial properties. And I know Munsrael's um, certainly done that. Um, I guess if you look at just some of the points of it though, uh, leverage wise, 70% is about maximum that you're likely to get out of a commercial loan. Uh, lease terms and things, Munzeril, I mean, you get a longer lease, but sometimes you can find it harder to find a tenant. So you do find that you've got greater vacancy rates amongst uh, commercial property, depending on where you're buying them, but you do get a good long-term uh, tenant and long-term lease when you do get them. Yields tend to be higher for the commercial um, properties. Uh, rates are slightly higher as well. All the lenders basically have a commercial arm um, and the serviceability calculators that they use are obviously a lot more generous when they're looking at your existing debts and things like that. Two dollars in the jar. That's good. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think there's anything else to really um, talk too much about, Ross, in regards to commercial uh, lending other than it is a new, it's an option once you hit your capacity, if you've still got equity to use and you've got a 30% deposit, um, it's certainly a good option for people to keep moving forward and diversify their portfolio um, on, on, on um, security types. Yeah, we've seen a couple of examples where clients have done some you know, developments and where they've got pre-sales because they capitalise the interest because this, their aim is to sell those properties at the end and they're not holding the property so they're not having to make repayments, which means the way the bank assesses it is based on having pre-sales in place rather than serviceability. So that's that's probably a co only other comment that, that I would make in terms of, but obviously, you know, do your due diligence, there's so much more risk with doing a a property development than your standard residential property so it's not for the uneducated it's someone you know you've really got to know your stuff and um, before you start thinking about going down that path. The question that comes in, in my mind Ross I suppose is that whether the residential property or a group of the residential property can potentially be treated as a commercial property as well it's a block of units right so what's the rule is it about four on the same complex is it about six or each bank is different? Yeah, each bank is different and uh, the, you know, the appetite in this current market is probably less um, than what we've had. You know, definitely a duplex is definitely considered um, residential. Um, in some cases we've had up to four with a, with a certain lender uh, be considered as residential. But, you know, we're talking about if, if, it's, if it's considered residential, it's assessed under the residential guidelines.
So if it's committed commercial, it's under the commercial guidelines. And you know, in some cases, we see that commercial lending is easier to get your loan approved than a residential. So yeah, you know, one, yes, the low rate is lower if, if you can get it approved as a residential, but two, you know, we're talking about how to get the banks to say less. If you're failing on a residential for an individual, then you're more likely you know, going to fail on that one as well. Sorry, did we have a question? You guys are doing helping clients? Commercial? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right, I think that's good for commercial. Just um, I'll move forward, guys, and uh, get Scott to talk about the rise, uh, what I'm seeing, especially with a lot of your Gen Y and your millennial investors. It's, it is the bank and the rise of the bank and mum and dad. So, Scott, if you just want to comment a little bit more about your mum and dad guarantees yeah. made and share with us what's happening in the market. Yeah, there's a few different ways I guess mum and dad can help. Um, there's cash, which is great when mum and dad want to, want to help with cash. Um, but often that comes with a loan attached to the back um, of that sort of a gift as well. There's, I guess we see lots of letters saying non-repayable gift, but how many of those are uh, non-repayable? Um, you know, not sure. But um, in terms of cash available, not many parents have the deposit size to give to their children. But what they do have in general is plenty of equity in a property if they've owned it for a period of time. So this works well for first home buyers investment or owner occupied so i know that most of you would have more than one investment property or, or potentially trying to get one off the ground so or have children that you're trying to help invest as well so i just wanted to run through it quickly there's a couple of different structures that we um, look at or that lenders look at when they're looking at um, guarantors and um, I guess one of the questions that we do get often is, dad earns a lot of money, he's happy to guarantee the loan, um, which is no longer allowed. You can't have a servicing guarantee anymore. So you can't have dad helping service, serviceability. You can only have dad helping on a security guarantee. So they can only give you equity in property. They can't help you um, with funds, basically, with income. So the first... The first lending structure um, is done in one loan, nice and clean. So we've got Bill and Jenny, they're buying a home for $800,000. Um, they've been offered assistance um, from mum and dad. The total lending is eight hundred. They've got 45000 to cover uh, stamp duty and costs. So they're wanting to borrow 100% of the property value. They can absolutely do that. Um, one loan, 800000 The guarantors and the borrowers are all on one loan. Uh, the first security is uh, Bill and Jenny's property that's valued at 800 and the second security is in the form of a limited guarantee, which is what the parents like to see. They don't want to put their whole home up. So it's actually done in the form of a limited guarantee against their home. Um, lenders prefer to see the home being put up uh, as an investment property, ideally. Um, if it's owner-occupied, often the lenders will want to see that mum and dad are actually still working and can cover the debt. Um, banks do not want to throw mum and dad out of their owner-occupied home. So if it all went pear-shaped, they certainly want the uh, parents to be able to cover any guaranteed um, amount if it's over the owner-occupied home. So um, limited guarantee, sitting against mum and dad's property. Um, the benefit of this is the total security given to the bank is a million dollars for the $800,000 loan, so it's 80%. So the kids, in effect, have borrowed 100% value of the property, but they've escaped mortgage insurance because it's actually an 80% loan. So the benefit of this is, one, they don't have to save for as long, two, they avoid mortgage insurance, um, and it gets them in, in, into a property sooner. The second structure, um, and this is lender-based, so C CBA do it this way, where they would do two, two loans. The first loan is purely in Bill and Jenny's name, and it's 640000 being 80% of the $800,000 purchase. So that sits perfectly just in their names. The second loan is for $160,000, which is against both properties. So it uses the guarantor's property and the $800,000 property that Bill and Jenny have bought. And both the guarantors and the borrowers are on that second loan. Um, often the parents like this structure because it gives a clear loan target for the kids to kind of pay down. Um, 
but the other one's not too difficult either. Once, it, once the loan hits 80%, they can free up the guarantee. So that's generally how the mum and dad bank works. It's very rarely is it cash. It's more in the form of um, equity and guarantors is sort of how we're seeing it. And there's a couple of different ways to structure it. But what I would always recommend um, to people is the insurance side of it um, to make sure that the, the kids are covered, basically, if there's something happened to either of them, that the debts are cleared purely for the fact of mum and dad, peace of mind of what can happen if, um, if something does go wrong um, like that. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Scott. What, what I am seeing now, obviously, with the lending becoming a little bit tight, and, and I suppose people need to think outside the box, and Manzula and I are seeing this quite a bit, and we're brainstorming a lot of clients how to keep them going, how to keep them investing. They've got a hunger and a passion for it. And we're hearing this word joint venture, joint venture, joint venture, and we're really, really coming up with, I think, exciting ways for people to continue to invest in, whether that's just buying a home for the long term or, say, potentially developing. So, Manzuril, just share with us a little bit about joint ventures and what are we seeing, and is this the rise potential of the next couple of years of joint ventures? It's, uh, you're a special purpose vehicle, as they call it, right? So this is where you've got a group of people who sort of join their resources, put together with a sort of some level of common cause as such. Now, the benefit of the joint venture as it is, is that you've got resources from each individual as such. And uh, resources from each individual means that while you've got bigger level of leverage, you, I suppose, is that your risk profile is relatively lower as well. Arguably, whatever your risk profile is relatively lower. The question that I have to Ross, I suppose, is that if there is a joint venture, and let's just say you've got four or five partners as part of the joint venture, so is it different to your partnership borrowing as an example, where each partner, let's say if you've got two partners, that two brothers, they're sort of buying a property combined together, and uh, the purchase price is about a million dollar, and, and you know, in their mind, it's each borrowing is about 500, from, but from banks' mind, is that because of the joint and the severe liability, each borrowing is one million, as opposed to 500,000 each. And when it comes to the serviceability, the bank takes half of the rent, but they take the entire sort of the, I suppose, the leverage. Mm. So how does it work from a joint ventures point of view? So it, it is similar. You know, we do have um, exceptions to the rule where certain lenders will look at it as, um, you know, a proportion of basically what their um, percentage of the rent is and what their percentage of the, the repayment is. Um, but, you know, in short... But again, you know, quite often in, with these joint ventures, quite often we're, we're seeing them done maybe on a commercial front um, where the rules are slightly different. And, and, and I suppose that's the thing in my mind that one needs to take into account. So Jeremy's point and Jeremy's question that each joint venture has to have its own business case. So we can go into a joint venture. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right thing from my point of view in shorter period of time as well as longer period of time. Now, a common example of the joint venture, I suppose, is that uh, the builder that we sort of spoke and sort of the landowner and such. So I've been seeing this quite a bit with a number of my clients that we have this land over the years and we can build it into a number of construction as such, but it's just that the funding is that much harder. So this is where sort of the builder comes in and the builder sort of says, all right, we'll reach into a joint venture. Whether I, as a builder, that I sort of capture most of our cost and we sort of manage that cost so you don't need to borrow from my cost as such. Or I as a builder, I've got my own funding where I bring in the funding. So you as a landowner and I as a builder, we reach into this joint venture and longer period of time we sort of see what's the sort of the profit, sort of the margin as such. Um, not for everyone, again, and must be looked into from a business case point of view. Jeremy, what, what I would be quite curious is that we've got a number of really, really prominent buyers in, uh, in here within ourselves, and we've got Paul, we've got Luke, we've got Jay as well. I'd be very curious to know from the buyer's agent's perspective is that what are you seeing on the ground? So we spoke about a few negative things as such. So uh, you guys sort of, I suppose, sell the properties to your clients, but you can't sell it if they don't get the finance. Is the finance really as doom and gloom, or people are still finding a way, Paul? Um, yeah, look, I think from a finance perspective, we haven't really... One thing we've found actually is that, that it's actually sped up a little bit. Uh, probably over the last two or three months, uh, probably more specifically, and I might be, 
might be laughed off the table from, from Ross and Scott from there, and they might be looking at it thinking, what's he talking about? But um, we've probably found that I think people are now starting to get their, their act together a little bit better because of the understanding that you really do need to be a bit more fastidious in your, your record keeping when you put your application in, it needs to be ready to go. Um, the expectation from the agents we're finding is actually a little bit better as well from their understanding that probably in the last eight to 10 months, finance is taking slightly longer to get through. So our ability to negotiate probably three, four week finance clauses in, in contracts is pretty easy these days compared to one, two years ago, not so much. Um, it is definitely, a, I think, a game of cash flow, but far more importantly than it has been over the last five years. And I think that that's going to be a very key aspect for the next couple of years is, is cash flow and how that affects serviceability for most clients is, is absolutely crucial. And that's for investors who have got their, who are buying their first investment through to their 21st investment. I think cash flow and how that affects their overall portfolio is a big, big factor these days and, and how all these other factors that are coming into the play are really going to affect their borrowing capacity long term. So that's something that's a lot more important than I think it has been over the last five years. Beautiful. Well, there, there's a couple points. And look, I do believe that it will be a rise of the joint ventures, people putting their resources together, their money, their borrowing capacity. Um, it's something that you need to make sure, obviously, you are speaking with your advisors about. It is not for everybody dealing with other people and maybe potentially other people spending money that is yours or potentially losing money that is yours. It's not a, a, not a nice thing, but nevertheless, still can be quite profitable if you go in there with the right business case. Um, Manzuru, we'll just get you to share a little bit about what you're seeing. You have spoken a little bit about private funding, um, but more so syndicates, to, it, similar to a joint venture, but a little bit larger, like a Brick X. Um, have a, I suppose, a, understand about the syndicates and what we're seeing on that level. Yeah, I suppose both from the private lending as well as syndicate. I mean, Ross sort of raised a whole bunch of bank and a whole bunch of bank, I suppose, Ozzy looked after a whole bunch of bank, which is a second year and the third year, some of the banks that I'm being sort of hearing and, and I haven't heard them that much. Some of them we know, so we know uh, of, when we say private banker, on fourth or fifth tier or second or third tier, either way, some of the banks which comes into my mind is that outside of your big four or big five is uh, Latrobe and Pepper and Liberty and, and I'm seeing quite a bit of funding with the Scottish Parish as an example. I'm seeing funding with homelines.com.au, I'm seeing funding with AFM. I'm seeing funding with Adelaide, Bank of Queensland, Bankwest, uh, ING, as well as Pink Tank quite a bit as well. So there are opportunities, right? I suppose where the syndicate is, syndicate is more sort of the bigger version and the wider version, I suppose, of your joint venture, right? A syndicate is a group of people who are coming in and saying that, well, this is a piece of land and, and, and we're building a big sort of a shopping centre as part of it. So what they do is that they do their prospectus, they go into the open world and they sort of go in the open world in, 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 a, in a more of a crowdfunding, so to speak, as people call it, right? The crowdfunding is to go into the open world saying that, well, that is our prospectus, we are building this shopping centre as an example, and as part of this building this shopping centre, we need to raise that much capital as such. So generally speaking, it's a unit trust that people sort of create. So you can sort of come in as a unit holder, you can sort of come in as, as, as more just a pure as a lender as such. And it's no different to many of your, say, Marvick or any other sort of the listed unit trust holder that you have. I suppose the question, Jeremy, comes in is that, you know, I mean, we are all investors, uh, but it's not so much investors for the sake of investors. We all leverage, but it's not so much the leverage for the sake of leverage. It comes back to your own business plan that is syndicate right thing from my perspective as a sort of a mom and dad investor, as a more sort of an entry level of investor, or is it more substituted? Beautiful. And there's lots lots of syndicates out there like your Brick X and Domicons, and these are crowdfunding places where obviously lots of people are going into buying properties in, in expensive markets. Now, um, I've done a little bit of a video for you. It's a great face to pull. My grandmother said to me 20 years ago, Jeremy, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. 20 years later, what she really meant was when the banks don't lend you money, do options. So options is something I've recently been doing lately. I'm laughing inside my head. I know we've got Jay smiling, which is I'm good. Well. Good, that's good. Options is something which is, it, it, it's got a lot, of, it, a lot of complexities around it, but it's very profitable if done right. It's essentially buying property, making profit with very little capital being introduced, using a lot of the brain knowledge that you've got, a lot of knowledge you develop over a number of years. And I'm going to show you guys just in a video 
of a, a recent option I've done, and I've been doing this the last three years. Some have done really well, some have maybe lost a little bit, but nevertheless, it's really exciting. And I think when the banks just say no, and you're at that position where you purely just can't get any more funding, you've exhausted Ross and Scott, they said to you guys, we're really sorry, but you've got $10 million worth of loan on a hundred grand income, and you still wanna get into property, this may be something that you wanna look at. There is a lot to it, um, but nevertheless, hope you enjoy the video. I'm no Paul Glossop on Sky News, um, so bear with me guys, it's my first one, but nevertheless, hope you enjoy it. Guys, welcome, I hope you're having a really good time tonight. I thought I'd change it up a little bit and do a bit of a video instead of me setting up there and talking about facts, figures and numbers, it gets quite boring, so I thought I'd do something a little bit more illustrative. I am in the office, so I do apologise for a little bit of any background noise or a bit of mess. Manzuril, thank you for donating your office for this one. And God, you feel sometimes a little bit smaller when you're standing next to a six foot tall whiteboard. But guys, I'm going to talk to you quickly about options. This is something I'm very passionate about, something I do quite regularly. I love it. It enables me to get still into the property market sometimes when the bank says no. Just a quick disclaimer, options aren't for everybody. There's a lot of things that you need to understand and learn. But nevertheless, this is just a quick short option that I've done in the western suburbs out here, not too far away from this place, Seven Hills. Guys, options, what it was. Now, I like to tee up the end result and the start result and then kind of fit everything in the middle in a very structured plan. But in this particular case, I had a builder. Builder come to me and said, Jeremy, I've got a $1.1 million budget. I'm looking to do five townhouses in Seven Hills. So it's very specific about the location, very specific about the price. He said, Jeremy, my budget's 1.1. Don't go over the top of it. I've already made provisions for stamp duty and other things, but essentially 1.1 is what I'm after. I haven't got the time. I know you've got the nows. I know you've got the experience. Go out and find me something. I said, not a problem builder. So I got onto, uh, onto Seven Hills, had a chat with a couple of agents, also had a very close friend of mine who I do this with, and he starts door knocking. We're trying to find parcels of land that fit inside the LEP and DCP of the Blacktown City Council, which allows us to do five town houses. Now, essentially, we found a corner block, 920, 930 square metres, good 22 metre frontage at the front, 38 metre frontage on the one side, enabled us to do a five town house development site. Now, when I say I enabled our builder $1.1 million to do it. Now, we negotiated the price at about 950. Now, in that area, at the time, we know market in Sydney starting to come down, but roughly speaking, he had an agent that could say, look, I'll get you 900, that's the maximum we can look at. You're probably looking at a purchase price of anywhere between eight to 900. I said to this particular gentleman, look, I haven't got the money to buy a particular property, but I know someone who does. However, to do so, I've got to spend a bit of time. I've got to spend some time with council, I've got to spend some money with council and other regulative authorities so I can get some reports going so we can enable this gentleman, the builder, to buy this 1.1 mil and build his five townhouses site. So I negotiated this particular vendor. I said, look, you give me 18 months, 18 months and I will find someone to buy your property for a price of around about, well, whatever it may be, 950. Now, in that 18 months, I'm going to give you a $10,000 refundable option fee. Now, refundable if I find somebody, non-refundable if I don't. So I said, you've got nothing to lose. You keep my $10,000 if I can't buy your property in 18 months, or if I can, then the $10,000 will come off the 950. So we found somebody. And this particular gentleman said, yep, 950, shook hands, got it done, option agreement signed with solicitors, of course, and we paid him $10,000. In that six months that we provisioned our time would be, we went to the council, we went and got our fire reports, we went and got our, uh, our LEP checks, our DCP checks, we worked with the town planner, and the overall cost was about 32 grand. So from start to finish, to get this thing DA'd, so we could build five townhouses. Our cost was about 32K and there's some other costs that the builder will pay as part of their construction price. Now in that process, what I did was is I've optioned obviously a property. So I've used only $32,000 of my own money for all the costs and another $10,000 of my own money for the option fee, which again, if it's successful, that 10,000 comes off that 950. Again, negotiated into the option contract. But for a property in Seven Hills on 920 square meter plus worth of land, I was able to secure a five townhouse development site that I could put obviously five townhouses on, not me, but the builder for $950,000. That is a really good price. Now, how did I make my money? It sounds like I've done a lot of work. Well, the builder told me his budget was 1.1 mil. I negotiated with the vendor 950,000. 
I've spent $10,000 in option fee, which is refundable off that $950 purchase price, and $32,000 was cost out of my back pocket in relation to DA and council fees. So essentially, 1.1 mil, less than 950 left me with 150,000, less my $32,000 in costs, my 10,000 was refunded against the purchase price, and that left me $118,000 in approximately four to six months of my time and my money, and that 118 was my profit. Now, beautiful thing about options is there's no GST, it's a financial instrument, so I didn't have to pay GST on that 118, although I do have to pay tax, and that tax obviously is based upon how you structure that option deal. So it's very important you talk with your accountant, very, talk, very important you talk with your solicitor and advisor before you enter an option agreement. But guys, that is a quick six to seven minute rundown of how an option works. There's many, many things involved in that transaction. I do recommend doing a lot of learning. Google's a great place, that's where I learn a lot of my things. But have a chat with some professionals. There's lots of cool things out there in the open market and open media to show you how options work in a breakdown. But essentially, 1.1 mil was my budget, 950 was my purchase price, and 32 grand was my cost, and my option fee was 10,000, which was refundable if successful. And keep in mind, it's not refundable if you're not. So just a big disclaimer out there, don't get too greedy because you can do lots and lots of different options and you can potentially lose your option fee if you don't negotiate the option contract right. So my advice is tick these things over one at a time. Don't get too greedy. Don't do 10 at a time. While the numbers sound really good, there is a lot of work involved to make that 118,000. And again, it all comes with experience. Enjoy the rest of the seminars. I hope you've uh, learned a little bit tonight. Jeremy, I've got a question for you. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, Contracts. Yes. So explain to everybody what the actual contract of sale, did it have the builder's name on it? Was there a middle contract that you signed in terms of the purchase contract? Yeah, it's a good question and, and the solicitors really work with this on the background but essentially you're signing an option agreement which is a right, not an obligation to buy the property with the, the vendor, the purchaser. Essentially when it's all cleared up you've got a contract which the solicitor will draw up where the builder is purchasing that particular uh, that property from the vendor and you're written into the contract obviously getting that portion of money. So it, it, the, the solicitors will do all this in the background. You're the middleman in between. So similar to like a, a, an agent who gets paid a commission and it's paid with the settlement funds. So that's essentially how it works in a nutshell. Lots of, lots of other things behind it to make it happen but really talk to your solicitor because there's lots of things in an options agreement you need to be made aware of, lots of legal things. And again, sometimes the way you do the option agreement, whether it's put and call options, stamp duty may be payable on the actual options agreement as well. So you just need to be very careful how you do it. That was, that's 18 months of learning put into seven minutes. There's lots of other things around options. And I suppose that's just to open your mind a little bit more to if you've got that bug and you wanna to continue to buy property, and you're really struggling for finance or you're struggling for that deposit, something like that may be an option for you to kick you into a buy and hold strategy over time. So it's little things, lots of other ways. Uh, an important um, thing to note in terms of, you know, why the profit was there, because in terms of Jeremy has increased the value of the property by doing the work. It wasn't a development site when Jeremy got this, but the time it was sold to the builder, it was a development site. So that is the, the difference between the 950, and I know I was asking that question myself, but you know, why, why then is Jeremy selling it to the builder for 1.1? Well, the reason that Jeremy's selling it, and the why, because Jeremy's done all the legwork to increase the value of that property, because that property now has De, you know, the development potential and the builder can go straight in and do what he needs to do. And that's where the, 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 the payment for your time has come into it. Yep. Jeremy, you're just, this is obviously, not to say you're a gambler, but the gambler talk about their wins and they want to talk about their losses. But you said to the there's been, there's been some losses, yeah, Can definitely. Share some, some insights oh, in the one that didn't work? Of course, the first ever one we did, we were bullish, we were, um, very bullish actually. Um, big, big parcel of land out in a place called Marsden Park, a uh, little bit greenfield. We were a bit gun ho and we said, yeah, $20,000 option fee, we're doing it. And we're going to subdivide this into 30 lots. We're going to get it all done and then we realised obviously all the subdivision costs and our pockets were a little bit empty. The butterflies were really flying out at that stage. 
Um, we worked out that there was a number of rezonings that we needed to do. Environmental court costs. Had no idea what environmental court was at that particular stage. Well over my head. Spoke to a couple of solicitors. I got, I think I got a couple of quotes for about a hundred thousand, eighty thousand, about one hundred twenty thousand dollars. Within, uh, you know, within four months of researching this particular option agreement, twenty thousand. I already spent the money in my head exactly. I was going to buy Ferrari. I was going to buy more properties. Lots of different things I was doing. I was spending the money before I even earned it. Um, within about two months of holding this particular option agreement, I went with my tail between the legs. And I, I like to admit when I've made a loss, I went to the vendor and said, mate, enjoy my hard earned $20,000. I can't carry through with the option. So that was the first one we ever did. And we worked out quite quickly that you know, there's a lot, lot more to it than just thinking every block of land or every parcel of land is a subdividable block. Um, you really need to understand, and I spoke in there about DCPs and LEPs, that is council restrictions. That's state and council restrictions. Lots and lots of pages. Uh, Blacktown DCP is about 142 pages. Their LEP is released over two volumes. Each, each booklet's about 120 pages. So there's a lot of reading that I've done. You're seeing six to seven minutes of numbers, but there is genuinely 18 months worth of background knowledge going into it. Can be very profitable. And on the other side, it can be quite, um, it can be quite detrimental as well. But there's been some couples, uh, a couple other ones where the smaller ones have done quite well. I've learned my lesson. I am not trying to do the 30 lot subdivision in Marsden Park. I'm trying to do the smaller ones, which is finding lots of lands and potentially subdividing it or DA in it and selling it. But I'm still an accountant at heart. I got burnt once, I'll never do that again. I'm really trying to match and align myself with builders who tell me, Jeremy, I've got 1.1 million to spend on a block of land. I don't want to spend any time. Make it happen, get me what I want for 1.1 and whatever you make in between is yours. So that's me kind of mitigating my risks now as I'm starting to go ahead and, and do more of this. So what would be your top three? Obviously there's risks and um, so what would be your top three sort of education tips for someone wanting to start looking at? Yeah, good question. Obviously, identify and understand in which area has, I suppose, the demand, right? You can, you're not gonna go do a, you can do lots of subdivisions out in Broken Hill, but the demand's not gonna be there. So for me, identifying the area with the demand for smaller lots where it can be subdivided or other things. Second one is obviously understanding option fees. So being willing to lose a particular amount of money. You could do an option fee where it's $100,000, that's really going to get the vendor happy, but it's not going to get you happy. So I suppose negotiating, sharpening your negotiating skills because a vendor and every single vendor I've been to has no idea what an option is. No idea. They think straight away you're trying to fleece them. Um, but mind you, I paid $50,000, $100,000 more than what an agent said that block would sell for as is. Remember, Ross mentioned I've done the hard work to bring it up to speed. And I suppose the third one, the most important one, is understand the value understand the value of which you're prepared to overpay to get that vendor to be happy. Those three things, if you can kind of work that out and have that team of solicitors behind you and understand the knowledge, there's lots you can achieve. There's also lots obviously you, you can make mistakes on, but knowledge is, is important. I'll just start to move forward guys and we'll leave some questions to the end. I'll, I'll leave some questions to the end. I will be hanging around. We've got Jay, Luke, Christine and Paul here, all buyers agents, and they'll be hanging around for a little bit as well. But Munzer, I'll just get you to summarise everything and I suppose come back to the important basics with Ross. But we sort of, uh, with the interest of the time, everyone would be around, Jeremy would be around, Ross and Scott, and Jay is here, Luke is here, and uh, Paul is here as well. So we'll all be around. Um, look, where do we start in terms of summarising all of those, Ross? I mean, we look back into all of those statistics and I sort of see all the statistics which is called sort of ran through <coughs> and I see lots of negatives with the statistics. I sort of question in myself that, well, what's the time frame within that sort of statistics as such? But nonetheless, there is no question that the market is subdued market at the moment. There is no question that the market is, if anything, it's dropping slightly. There is also arguably is, is suggested that the drop hasn't reached its bottom as such. Arguably, it's suggested that 2019 probably will be a year of interesting year, if I may, or challenging year, however way we see it. So the market is a declining market, depending on where we sort of see. So there's a lot of, lot of, I suppose, cautious that we sort of say. But at the same time, I still look into the longer term. I look into the last 20 years of my investment. I look into the next 20 years of potential investment. And I say that my market goes into cycle. 
and there is always some level of opportunity, there is some level of funding during that period of time. Whether we go through with your sort of the second tier, whether we go through third tier, fourth tier, whether we look through joint venture, whether we look through option, whether we look through other matters, or whether we sort of say, well, this is the time that we take it slow and steady. We are investing not for one year, we're investing for longer period of time. And it's okay for a short period of time that if we don't do much, it's okay. What is important in my mind is that yes, we stay conservative. What is important in my mind is that yes, we we sort of we sort of see in medium to longer period of time whether the interest rate goes up a bit, whether my interest only doesn't sort of extend, whether the bank change their mind and test say so take away your business and go somewhere else. And we've seen that, right? Those crazy things that when it happens that you are not being forced to sell your property. And I say that very often, that whether the market goes up, whether the market goes down, the investors who loses are the investor who panics and sells it in the wrong period of time. And if you don't sell it by panicking, or whether you've been forced to sell it, then in longer period of time, it all works out well. So just a very brief example. So you spoke about the negative gearing as an example, and there is a quite a bit of publication that whether the Lemon government potentially coming in, whether the negative gearing is being taken away, whether the CGT discount is being reduced, whether the principal place of residence to be uh, taxed, and, and, and much more that they're sort of saying. One may argue that we tried it in the past, and one may argue that, well, is it going to work because we tried it in the past. But the lesson which I take from there is that when the negative gearing was attempted back in the mid-80s and say late 80s as such, is that the people who sort of lost are the people who could not hold on to that investment property during the period of 1985 to 88, 89, when the negative gearing was taken away and negative gearing was reimposed again, right? So my comment to uh, my clients, uh, to people that I know, is that you, there are things that we can control, there are things that we can't control. Let the Royal Commission do what the Royal Commission is supposed to do. Let the banks do what the banks are supposed to do. In your mind, you have to have your leverage. You, you have to have your mitigation. In your mind, you have to have your cash flow. In your mind, you have to sort of say that, well, as an investor, as it is with a business owner, that sometimes we go into an expansion and sometimes we take a step back. Mm. And it's okay to take a step back. And at the same time, it is not all a stop. There are opportunities. Yeah. So, I think that's a fantastic summary. So I just wanted to, you know, just with the tips in terms of, you know, the tips and I'll leave you with those is review your rates, review your expiry dates for your fixed rates and your interest only, um, have a plan in terms of, have a plan so you can hold your property long term and make sure you've got your cash buffers in place. So that's, that's really, really important. And the other thing is for investors who are still, you know, looking, there's opportunities in this market. Fear and greed provides opportunities. So wherever there's, um, wherever there's fear, there's opportunities. And, you know, I was discussing that with Paul before, and he's seeing some really good opportunities, um, you know, that, that aren't in your market when things are going gangbusters because, you know, people are buying and there's there's a lack of stock on the market. Once you see stock sitting around, that, that whole fear and greed plays in and people think, oh shit, I need to get out. Uh, and, and, and they're prepared to you know, sell their property. And, and that's how we make our money you know, in property investment. And I know the best buyers that I've had is the ones where I've really bought well under market value. So, um, yeah, have a look at the opportunities would be, be, be the final thing, but, and, and have the provisions in place. So, um, great discussion. I've you know, always learned learn things, and uh, yeah, I think it's a, a really relevant, really relevant topic. Beautiful. Thank you very much, guys. This is, our, uh, this is our last seminar for the year, so a lot of people will be sticking around um, for a little while. I'd like to thank, um, yeah, I'd like to thank Ross, Scott and Munzuru for their contribution. Now, anyone who has liked the Australian Property Educators Facebook page, I used to manage it, I don't, lovely Diana does now, so it's looking fantastic and pretty. We are starting to do property podcasts called WeChat Properties, and we've done a couple. 
Um, at the moment, they are getting a bit better. We're still learning lots as we're going on, but the content is fantastic. You're sitting down with, and you're listening to four people really just talk and, and chat about properties, about what they're doing, about what their clients are doing, about their thoughts. Um, I learn a lot in that uh, three, four hour sessions that goes through, and I can tell you all of us come out completely and mentally exhausted at the end of it, but we thoroughly love it, and we're gonna be doing a lot more. So. Get onto the Australian Property Educators Facebook page. Give it a like. WeChat Properties is the podcast. Yeah, so it's on iTunes and all the, all the, what was it? SoundCloud, iTunes. I'm subscribed to it. I think there's about 60 or 80 others. It's fantastic. I've listened to it many, many times um, in the car. I love it. It's, it's so. only just come out. I, it, <laughs> yeah, it's, got, it's 60, 70. I love it. It's getting there without any marketing. But... Um, guys, the seminars for 2019, those dates will be released um, next year. So we'll be sending out some emails to let you know when they are. Thank you very much.